just wanted to really just start today by saying it really is an honor to be here today. I, I've been here, what, three or four times to the barn, and it's really beautiful that you guys are doing here, so it really is exciting to see. I feel like coming up on stage, it almost feels embarrassing with the amount of talent that we have here. Like, it really just feels like, what are everyone else on that TV wasting their time? There's so much talent here. Give yourselves a round of applause, my word. Yeah, these artists are insane. I really, really am impressed. It's, it's beautiful to see. Right, so I'm going to come and speak today about how to start a YouTube channel. Uh, this is me when I was small, just to make sure that you all know that I was ugly. I was ugly and I was fat and I was shy. And I really did have no self-interest at all. I was very um, hidden away. I was ADD. I was on Ritalin. I was told that I was not going to be much, I suppose, because I was failing grade 7 and grade 8. Um, and somehow, somewhere, that changed. And I think it's important to realize that no matter where we've sort of come from, there are always hope for us, no matter how fat you look in a wet t-shirt competition. <laughs> So this is where I got into the media, and it was all a big mistake. And I think that that is the big thing that I want people to know about breaking into the world of media. This right time, right place thing really is a, it really is a thing. I had the huge privilege of going to go study at UCT, and I was doing my degree there. And while I was there, I got into UCT radio, and I was doing graveyard shift from 3 to 6 in the morning. Um, it was awesome. And then, very unluckily, but luckily for me, the Drive Time show host uh, got um, a really serious illness, and they, I was the only one who was standing by at the studio at that time, and so they put me on that show, and at that day, at that time, at that particular space, Hectic 99 came to, SA, uh, well, came to UCT Radio to ask people to audition. I wish I could play this video for you. It won't work now. I, I don't think there's... Are we connected to the internet? Actually, no, leave it. I'll, play, I'll send you guys the link or something at some point. But the audition was horrendous, so horrendous that I don't know how I ended up on television thereafter. Um, but it was really a horrible audition. I think it just got to realize that people see something in you that you don't see in yourself eventually. Um, and then that kind of leads into something else. So that's how I got into the media. I then ended up sort of maturing a little bit and ended up on SABC3 with Afternoon Express. Um, please don't ask me how it's like working alongside, alongside these women. My word. They are incredible powerhouses in the industry, um, really huge personalities, and to try and find your own voice in that space is really hard. But I really enjoyed the sort of, almost, what is it, three years that I was on Afternoon Express, the sort of five that I was on Hectic 99. And so I've officially been in the media for about nine years, and it all just happened, I guess, by luck and being in the right time, right place. Um, and so many young people in South Africa who I meet who message me on Instagram, who find me on Facebook and always ask me the questions about breaking into the industry or want to know like, if there's a golden ticket to getting there. And I just wish there were more young South Africans who started their own platforms like YouTube to start telling their stories because they really are incredible and television just doesn't have enough space to tell your story. Um, and they're looking for a very unique, particular picture of story that I, I think is warping our minds. Um, and there are a lot of young South Africans who have much better stories to tell than Jeannie, Bonnie, Bonang, or myself. Um, so I really hope that by today we'll get a sense of how we can all start YouTube channels and tell our stories. So I currently now do this now that I'm not off television. I, well, I'm off television at the moment. I run, I got to co-found and run this business for the last two years. It's called Special Effects Media and we're a YouTube specialist company and we help grow brands on YouTube. We're working with some really cool cats. I wasn't too sure who you guys would know, um, like which kind of South African YouTubers you guys are following. But a lot of the beauty vloggers that are in SA are uh, with us. Uh, and our job is to really work alongside them to help them grow their platforms. And then ultimately, what do we want them to do? Make money. <laughs> yeah, shame. <laughs> Build an audience though first. But yes, the idea is to try and make money. A lot of these YouTubers and people who have started their own platforms start with doing it for the love of it. And then realize, wait, this could be something I could commercialize. And so I'm hopefully going to get today a, a, a sense of how we can start doing that with our own channels as well. Um, don't worry about this. That's unimportant. Right. Let's start with the burning YouTube questions. Um, the things that I get asked all the time is, when is the best time to upload? How often should I be uploading? How do I grow a channel? And how long should my videos be? I think everyone keeps asking me that question. I will tell you this from the get-go. It is a crap load of work to grow a YouTube channel. It doesn't happen overnight. You can ask yourself, you can produce content for 18 months in a row, and you still won't have 5,000 subscribers. It is a lot of work, all right? But I, there are some key things that if you do take into account, you'll manage to build a platform that I think is sustainable, will grow an audience, and eventually will start making you money. Now, the only way to grow an audience on YouTube is through things like consistency. So when you ask me how long a video should be, it doesn't matter, but keep it consistent. If you ask me when you should upload, it doesn't matter. Just keep it consistent. If you ask me all these other questions, my answer to you is always going to be consistency. If you look at all of the dating relationships you've had in your life, if a guy or girl says to you, I'm always on time and I'm never late, and they're always late, 
Do we trust them to be on time? No. Right. So same thing happens with a platform like YouTube. Because it's not run like an algorithm like Facebook and Instagram, people really want to build trust by knowing what they're subscribing to. And the only way for people to know what they're subscribing to is if you're consistent about what you're producing content-wise. A lot of people go like, oh, I tried this, it didn't work. I'm going to try this, and then that didn't work. I'm going to try this, and that didn't work. And you won't build subscribers that way because people don't know what they're going to be subscribing to. So YouTube goes through, and, and excuse me because we, uh, we downloaded this as a, as a PowerPoint, so some of the things, the, the graphics are a bit skewed, but don't stress too much about it. I want to talk to you about the three forms of content that we're going to be talking about today. YouTube always defines these three main versions of content that you need to have on a platform for it to be successful. They are hero, hub, and help content. Now, hero content is the stuff you don't produce very regularly. It's a once-off piece of content that you produce on your platform that goes out and it gets new audiences and draws them into your brand. The second is your hub content, which is why am I here? Who are you? So if you're a makeup artist, I know you're going to do makeup tutorials every single week, and every single week there's going to be a new eyeshadow. We get it. So we know that that's our hub content. That's what we're there to learn from you. But every so often, you'll try something new, like you'll go do something in travel, or you'll go and, you know, I don't know, do something that's completely out of your ordinary to go and draw new audiences into your funnel, right? The last bit is this here, uh, this here, uh, uh, help content. So we've done Hub Hero and now Help Content, which is trying to teach people things, right? So YouTube is a search engine. So people go there to find answers to questions. What questions can you help them answer? So example of Hub Content is this guy called Liberable. He's based here um, in Cape Town. He lives in Athlone. He's the biggest car channel in South Africa, um, and nobody knows about him. He has now, that number is very skewed, but he has over 30,000 subscribers on YouTube. And he started out being super awesome by producing these um, robot racing videos. And so people knew him for robot racing videos. These videos are sitting uh, now over 100,000 views a video. People really love watching and re-watching these, these races. Every so often, he'll start doing hero pieces of content where he'll do a review of a car, or he'll try and do something completely out of his ordinary. But in a good example of hub content would be Niaz. Then Devin Don did it as a good example of this hub content. You can know his style. You know he's going to produce comedy. You know it's going to be in skits. We know Devin to be a, the funny guy in Cape Town. We don't know him to be doing other random things. So when he starts doing <laughs> content like he did most recently with the um, army comments, which got him into a lot of trouble, that would be considered his hero pieces of content, which goes out and says to people, share this piece of content. It's viral. It's out there. It draws new audiences in. Now, a good example of hero content is what the guys from... Um, Red Bull decided to do. They sent a guy up into the lithosphere and made him sky, what do you call it, skydive out of space. And so he skydived from the edge of space down to Earth. And we don't know Red Bull to be those people. We know Red Bull to be racing. We know Red Bull to be, gives you wings. We know Red Bull to be the, like, I don't know, extreme sports and stuff. We don't know them for this, for this kind of content. So this would be considered hero content. And then someone like Akila produces a lot of helpful tips, like here's six ways to do this. Here's five things you didn't know about this. Um, she starts to explain new information like that. So I'm flying through this, by the way. So if you guys want to stop me, please stop me. But I've only got 20 minutes to get through all of this. Right, the big thing that I'm noticing in South Africa is a lot of young people don't know how to find their niche. Everyone sees beauty as a big industry. Let's all be beauty vloggers, right? Everyone sees travel as a big industry. Let's be travel vloggers. It really will not work if you do that because you end up going to looking like this poor guy. Please do not like grass and stuff. Try and find something that is really unique to you. Now, we've learned on YouTube that there's one way to be able to do that, and that's about combining at least two or three different passions together to make something that we've never seen before. So if you happen to be a makeup artist and you know how to do makeup tutorials, but perhaps you're good at dancing as well too, you can combine two passions together and do makeup twerk tutorials as a silly example, right? This is something we've never seen before. I know it's crazy. Please don't look for too long. You'll, get, you'll have nightmares. I swear, this one will probably give you more nightmares, but yeah, anyway, this will probably give you nightmares. Um, so this is a very frivolous example to explain something that's really deeply rooted in content. And I think a lot of people don't know how to do this, how to say, hey, I'm a makeup artist, but I've got something else about me that is unique, that is different. And how can I fuse those two things together to bring you something that you've never seen before? We're seeing a lot of content on YouTube that's never going to grow and it's never going to see the light of day because it's just like everybody else. Um, and I think that's what's the beautiful, beauty, beautiful thing about South Africa is we do really have such unique personalities, such unique style, ideas. We need to bring those to the fore because not everybody can be a famous beauty vlogger. I won't run through those. 
but this is what I'm talking about, those three different categories. Take a genre of content, lifestyle, social, commentary, reviews, beauty, tech, comedy, politics. Try and combine it with a kind of format that you like. Is it long form, short form? Is it going to be more than one person? Is it just going to be me? I'm not going to be present at all. And the third thing is add something that is unique to you. So whether you're good at arts, events, movies, cinematography, whatever it's going to be, and combine those two things together because then it's something we've never seen before. Now, the big one that I think a lot of people forget is this personal branding side. You, my friend, are a brand. No matter who you think you are, what you think your channel is going to do, we only know so much as you put out there on the internet, right? We don't know your upbringing. We don't know your childhood. We don't know your intentions. We don't know what you value. So the only thing we know about you is what you put out on screen. And so a lot of people, we even did this most recent exercise with Rolene Strauss. She now started a YouTube channel. I don't know if any of you guys have seen Rolene Strauss's YouTube channel. No, no. Go subscribe. Um, we need them. So what was really difficult about her brand is that everyone knows her to be this Miss Pris and Proper, sort of Miss World, Miss SA. And so what is she like? How many years later, what do, what do people care now? And she started doing things like spoken word poetry, and she released these spoken word poems. And everyone was just like, who is this? We don't know you to be this person. And she never took her audience on a journey towards this new person that she was trying to become. And so we started building a YouTube channel for her that was really on brand, that started taking viewers on a journey of, her, of herself to get to this point now where she can express the side of sort of coaching that she has. So I just want to say that this idea of personal branding is an ongoing process and you're establishing a sort of prescribed image or impression in the mind of others as an individual group or an organization. Now the way to do your personal branding is number one, have a focus. And I think a lot of people say, say that a sort of way to capture audiences to go broad that's never the way to capture an audience on YouTube, especially not in South Africa. There's something like 500 hours of content being uploaded every minute to YouTube. So if you're gonna do things that everyone else is doing, you're gonna lose out quickly. So our thing is have a focus, go niche. Find a voice. Now this is the part about gen being genuine and being authentic. We hear these, these words a lot when it comes to the media. We hear it a lot when it comes to being a sort of artist or a famous person or whatever else is in, the, in, in your working world. Being genuine is the key element to what YouTube will define as a successful or a non-successful channel. People come to YouTube to build communities. And if they don't actually know who you are, or you kind of put on this facade, so I, know I don't mean any sort of, I don't mean this in a mean way, but I mean, you can't be Genie D on, on YouTube. It just won't work for you. Um, you've got to be somebody who people can relate to, who you can be vulnerable, and someone that you can share your personal life with. And so if you're planning to build a YouTube channel, this authenticity thing is vital. Tell a story. Again, a lot of people want to produce content that they think they find interesting because it's their lives, but do other people find this stuff interesting. A lot of our corporate brands do this a lot. They say like, hey, come shoot a video at our, at our event and like, let's put our event video out. Who cares? Like, I was really at the event and if I wasn't at the event, I wasn't there, so I don't care, really. Um, start thinking about what stories you're going to be telling that are interesting to the person watching. And this is where you as personal brands need to take off your marketing hat and put on an entertainer's hat as well and realize, is this something that anybody would find interesting and, and, and intriguing? And this consistency thing, be somebody and be that person consistently so people can learn to trust you. Be ready to fail is the big one. I'll talk, talk you through Cynthia Guebu's platform now, but I'll tell you that being ready to fail is one of the great things you need to realize about YouTube. It's going to be trial, 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 fail, 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 until you find something else that really, like, really channels your energy. Create a positive impact. Create, so what, what, actually, what value are you actually adding other than saying, I want to be famous, look at me, I have a YouTube channel and I'm so great. People don't have time in their day to look after yourselves, never mind themselves. Start thinking about what you're going to be adding that's of value to the person watching. Then live your brand outside of your YouTube channel because I will see you in the street, I will say hi, and I will know that you're not wearing those shoes you wore on that platform. So I gotta make sure that you can live the lifestyle that you've built for yourself. I find with a lot of these sort of big lifestyle beauty vloggers, you guys all see them, think that they're super wealthy. They really aren't. They're still driving small vehicles, they still are struggling through life. And because they've now built this brand that's online, they need to keep that lifestyle up. And so the minute you kind of lose that brand, what happens to you as an individual? And I think that that personal downfall is quite, is quite dra traumatic to go through. And then also let other people tell your story too, because if you are genuine and they meet you in the street and you are that person they know from online, they'll share. They'll share that content, they'll talk about you, they'll share their ideas in newspapers and articles. So let other people share your story. So let's talk about Cynthia Guebu as a good example. I'll fly through this for time's sake, but she's got a YouTube channel and she defines herself as a South African beauty and lifestyle YouTube channel where I share my latest obsessions, beauty favorites, vlogs, and other such things. Do we know her to do that? 
Why are you saying no because I was dissing them earlier? No, she does. She does, she does, she does. Because look at all of her platforms. On the one side here, she talks about, this is obviously her, her YouTube channel. She lives on YouTube, she breathes YouTube, she produces content regularly on YouTube. On her Instagram page, she says there, go to my YouTube channel, new videos, clicks down to her YouTube channel. She's got links to all of her YouTube videos in all of her content. If you go to her Facebook page, her first thing that you see is watch the videos. If you go to her Twitter account, it says subscribe to my YouTube channel. We know her to be a YouTuber. She's consistent about that. Go to her website. It says look at my YouTube channel. It's up first in terms of her content. So everywhere you go, YouTube, uh, Cynthia is authentic to being a YouTube star, right? She's got an amazing aesthetic as well, so that's where her Instagram page has grown too. But she really is a YouTube first creator. And so when she says I'm a YouTuber, we don't think she's lying to us. We believe her. Right, let's talk about the boring stuff. The best practice, right? We call best practice all the stuff you need to know in order to make sure that the search engine knows how to find you and know that people who watch YouTube content understand how to interact with your content. So the first is your visual brand and your channel identity. There's a thing called your banner, obviously, which is right at the top of the page. You guys always see that when you log in. Most people don't have those banners, and if they don't have those banners, or if they do have them, they're generally not sized for mobile and for desktop, and so make sure that you do that with all of your content. You see all the social media links on the right-hand side? Those need to be included. Uh, those are clickable icons. If people come up, stumble across your platform, they can click to other platforms that you are on. Um, and then your sort of homepage layout. So most people just have kind of uploaded videos or most, most popular videos, which is an automatic playlist that's loaded as you, when you're on YouTube. Did you know that you can cu uh, curate an actual whole bunch of playlists on your homepage to be what you want people to see? You can curate people's content from other channels, from your own channel, and you can make your homepage look like a really cool website. I think that's something that people don't know about. Um, the sort of thumbnails, so YouTube works on this really cool funnel. It's obviously a consumer funnel. It starts with an impression, then to a click-through rate, from a click-through rate to a view, and from a view to watch time. Now, watch time is what really YouTube decides is valuable content. Now, an impression is every time your thumbnail appears on somebody's screen. So every time I see your video thumbnail, like you'll see here uh, on these thumbnails on the, on the screen right now, which one of these thumbnails stands out to you the most? And I've obviously already circled it, so you know the answer. But the top right, um, because of the fact that Trevor and them have got that yellow banner at the bottom, every time you see yellow banner, you know it's Comedy Central. Um, it's something that's unique. It just catches your eye immediately. That kind of stuff is important for your impressions, to make sure that when people see that, they click on it. Um, otherwise, you're just another thumbnail than a whole bunch of other thumbnails. So you'll see the, the good YouTubers try and build something into their thumbnails that's eye-catching, that's intriguing, that kind of has a sense of, oh, clickbait. You know, I must click this to find out what's going to happen. Then the SEO side of things. So do you guys know what SEO is? Raise your hand if you don't. Cool. SEO is search engine optimization. It's the way that Google, who owns YouTube, manages to find your content, right? So you put content out on the internet and you think your friends are going to find it. They will not find it unless you give them a direct link to it. Search engine optimization is where you basically type in keywords as tags. We call it metadata. And that's what YouTube uses to try and find your content, to tell you what this is even about. Because it doesn't watch the video like a human being and go like, oh, let's put it into this category. It's measuring words that you're using. It's listening to the audio. It's measuring a thumbprint of this content and saying to an audience member who's browsing things like beauty, oh, you might like Cynthia Gray, but she also produces beauty. Take a look at this video. So if you don't do these things, your content will never be found. And for most of our YouTubers, you might think that the audiences are coming from Instagram or Facebook. 60, 60 to 80 percent of the audiences are coming through from search. People typing in Cynthia Grebu makeup review, Cynthia Grebu eyeshadow, makeup tutorial, eyes, etc., and stumbling across this content. And so your search engine optimization is something that is really, really vital, which is why we partner with YouTube creators in South Africa, because a lot of them don't know how to do it. It's a lot of work, and it's time-consuming and technical. So if you ever need help with understanding the search engine side of YouTube, please shout. I'm happy to take and field questions whenever we can. This is fun stuff, but you guys ever see these end cards at the end of video? At the end of videos? They're little clickable icons on screen that you can have. Most of our YouTubers who start out don't include these end cards. And they're really cool ways to keep people in your content funnel. Because at the end of the, if you guys watch YouTube content, you'll see often that little circle appears in the middle of the screen to say, like, watch next. You just want to freaking break that thing. Um, if you're a clever YouTuber, you've got 20 seconds at the end of your video to suggest other content that's on your channel to the viewer, which they can click on as like, hey, if you like this video, you might like this one, or check this video out, or subscribe to the channel. All that kind of stuff keeps people within your content funnel, so YouTube's not sending them away to other people on the platform. 
Voting in polls and using things like info cards allows people to click to other parts of your website, allows people to watch other content. You can say, remember that last video when I collaborated with X, Y, and Z? You can point to the top of the screen and there's a little icon there that you can click and click to a new video, which is pretty cool. So include all info cards when you're uploading your content and then engage, engage, engage. Now, who, raise your hand if you've heard of the YouTube Partner Program. Ooh, that's, thanks Fred. It's good to know. Now the YouTube Partner Program was instantiated in 2017 when a YouTuber, well, it kind of was sparked on by this conversation when one of the world's biggest YouTubers filmed a guy hanging from a tree in Japan. And it wasn't illegal content in any way, shape or form. It was a suicide forest in Japan. Um, but what happened is the advertisers came to YouTube to say, I'm not really concerned because my ad appeared to millions of people on the internet before this content, and I don't want my brand to be associated with stuff like this. And so it started a conversation within YouTube to say, we're no longer interested in viral videos or one-hit wonders. We're interested in advertisers having their content appear, their ads appear only on content that is authentic, that is content that is consistent, and that people actually find engaging. And so the only way to place ads on your YouTube channel, and thereby earning the big dollar money, Money, is to ensure that you're part of the YouTube Partner Program, which means you need to have 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch hours of content in a 12-month period, which makes most people go like, I'm not even going to try, right? But if you get to that point, that's the only time that you can start monetizing. And it's a smart move from YouTube because it prevents these people from having sort of one-hit wonders or starting these random channels with crappy content on it, making your browsing experience so messy. Um, it allows you to at least only have content that's gonna sh that you're going to see that is worthwhile watching. So how do you get watch time? If I watch um, one minute of a video, you watch three minutes, and you watch two minutes, one plus three plus two is six minutes, that's six minutes of watch time. You need, you need uh, 40,000 watch hours of, 4,000, sorry, watch hours of content, not minutes, watch hours of content in a 12 month long period. Right, let's talk about money. How advertising works on YouTube is Google, people buy ads through Google. Those, uh, that, ad, that ad revenue is split with the creator. The creator keeps 60%, Google keeps 40%. And then that's how the, you guys make your money. So whenever you hear YouTubers making money, this is how they make their AdSense revenue. I'll tell you now to give you some figures so that you can start planning your futures. Some of our biggest YouTubers, there's a guy called Nsantla on Life. He's based in Durban. He reviews Uzalo, Sibaya, all of the big soapies. And he really is, he's just a young guy who, like, honestly, this guy <laughs> talks from his bed, basically. He lies in bed and talks to you. He's got something like 45, 46,000 subscribers now. He's insane. He's making on, app, like on, a, on his best month ever in a sort of year, he can make 10 grand out of YouTube, just the YouTube AdSense revenue, just from ads appearing on his content. Uh, that has been his, sort of his best month to date. So YouTubers can make some money, but you're not going to be a millionaire from AdSense revenue at an audience size of about 30, 40,000 subscribers. Once you get to that 100,000, 200,000 Mishlali level, then maybe we can start talking about earning AdSense revenue, all right? So it's a balancing act of, 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 of where the ads are coming, how much people are spending on those ads, etc. So most people think that you put more ads on your content, you'll make more money. It's not the case, because the more ads you put on your content, the less likely people are to watch your content, which means the less likely they are to earn the revenue. I don't need to go through this because we're going to run out of time. Um, let's talk through these things, how to secure the bag. Let's talk about the ways to make money through brand sponsorships. Most of our creators make money this way. So they make a little portion of their revenue every single month from AdSense. The rest of it they make from these brand collaborations. You would have known that the ARB are now starting to clamp down on advertising and making sure people declare that this was an advert. I was paid to say these things. Um, but there's two ways to do brand sponsorships if you want to collaborate with brands. And they're either through passive uh, content. So who watches the chicken connoisseur? No one. Oh, guys, go check out his channel. It's awesome. He literally goes to all the chicken. I mean, it's in the States, so, no, so he's not really South African, so it doesn't really matter. But he goes to check out all the famous chicken wing spaces all across the States, and he just reviews chicken wings for a living. That's literally his job. Um, and he gets, he's got 675,000 subscribers on his channel. I think he's over a million by now. Um, and he basically, just in the beginning of his video, literally, you start on his shoes, and he just he says, he doesn't even mention the brand's name. He just says, these cakes are dope. Let's get on to this shop, and he goes and moves forward. And brands pay him hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce content like that, because they don't want it to be like, hey, these shoes are $9.99 at takealot.com. Please go and get them. You know, he doesn't do that kind of stuff. So he really is focused his energy on this passive uh, brand, brand alignment. And then you get the slight more partnerships, whether you think the content is interesting for the consumer. So like somebody like Liberable, he reviewed a, like a power bank that can jumpstart your car. 
That's insane. Yeah, so he's a car review guy. He found a power bank, a jump starts your car brand, paid him to talk about it. It's valuable for his audience. And that's how he managed to build a, tr a trade exchange. That's how you make money. So what our experience thus far, we've currently sold, I think, one and a half million rands worth of influencer campaigns in the last 12 months. And most of those brands who I've spoken to all want these certain things when it comes to collaborating with YouTubers. The first is relevance. They are so tired of saying this person's popular or I know this person or everyone's trying to go like, oh, I had Bonang on my campaign. They really want to try and get a sense of is this who the audience is this person is speaking to? Are they relevant to my brand? The second thing is engagement. A lot of creators don't, don't reply to comments, don't do anything. But when a brand campaign's there, it's like, please comment on my video. Tell me, do you like the color? Which color should I have these shoes in? And everyone's like, I don't even know you for this. So make sure that you engage a lot with content in your regular sort of stuff. So when you are collaborating with, with brands, you do manage to make that money. Um, reach is a big thing. I'm finding a lot of South African YouTubers are just too small to collaborate with brands. Uh, they've got bigger Instagram pages. Brands want to collaborate with guys on Instagram and Facebook because YouTubers watch 30,000 subscribers really in the grand scheme of things. And so this is what our brands are really demanding is reach and try and find clever ways to do that through collaborations and through, through paid advertising. Right, then authenticity is the other one. And the authenticity is the other big one, making sure that you are authentic to who you are as an individual. Because when brands want to collaborate with you, they want to know who you really are. Because often they collaborate with these creators who are just not authentic, they're not true, they can't afford the product in any case. So why would we believe that you can afford this lifestyle and then go and buy the product thereafter? I want to know that you use this thing really in your everyday life. And then the last bit is frequency, making sure you produce your content regularly and try and do campaigns often. And I think if you as a young person can find what really brings you, like brings you to life, what makes you come alive, do that thing because then the channel and stuff will all come naturally. The finances will come naturally. The audiences will come naturally. Find something that really makes you passionate, gets you like excited to wake up in the morning. Please don't come to me and say, I want to start a YouTube channel because I want to be famous. It really will be, a, it'll be a depressing journey for you. It'll be a long, hard slog for you and it will really be difficult. But if you say to me, I'm really passionate about this thing and I don't care about the audiences right now. I just want to tell my story. Those are the channels that are going to do, do the best. So thanks very much for your time today, guys. I appreciate it.